I'll take you through a typical ArcViz composition workflow that involves compositing render passes, clipping and masking layers, and placing cutouts. I'm starting with a final render from 3ds Max and V-Ray. In addition to the final pass, I've also saved out various render passes, such as the reflection, refraction, and specular passes. I'll select these passes, then click drag them into Affinity Photo and release the mouse button over the document to place them as additional layers. These have center aligned to where my cursor was when I placed them. To align them to the document bounds, I can quickly select the Move tool using V, enable snapping on the toolbar, then drag them into place. With the three layers still selected, I can then change their blend mode to screen, which will blend them through and composite the layer information on top of the base background layer. Screen is preferable to add for most workflows. Add will simply do a linear addition of pixel values, and so highlights can easily be clipped. Screen prevents this highlight clipping, making it much more suitable for compositions with bright areas. One benefit to compositing render passes is being able to control each pass further using non-destructive techniques. For example, I'll add a curves adjustment with Command M on Mac, Control M on Windows. Then I'll click drag this curves adjustment layer and bring it over the text of the reflection layer. Then release the mouse button. This will child layer it into the reflection layer. This means the effect of the adjustment is now clipped to this layer. So if I click drag on the curve graph to add a node and bring it to the left and up, I can easily increase the brightness of the reflection detail. I can apply this technique to another render pass, which I'll bring in. Before doing anything else, however, I need to be mindful of my layer stack position. I currently have a child layer selected. If I import another image, I want to place it as a parent or top level layer. So to ensure this happens, I'll select the topmost layer in the layer stack first. Then I'll go out to my file browser and drag drop this glare render pass into my document. I still have the move tool selected, so I can quickly snap this layer into place. Then, as with the other render pass layers, I'll set this layer's blend mode to screen. The effect is, however, quite subtle. I might want to make it more prominent. At this point, I'm going to set up some custom keyboard shortcuts to make my compositing workflow more efficient. To map custom shortcut keys, I can go to the app settings. I can use Command Comma on Mac, Control Comma on Windows to quickly bring the settings dialog up. I'll click on the shortcuts entry to the left. Then I want to click on the second drop down box to access different categories containing various operations. I'll start with the layer category. This mirrors the layer entry on the top menu. Scrolling down the list of operations, I'm going to assign Option B to the Brightness Contrast Adjustment, Option M to the Channel Mixer Adjustment, Option N to the Normals Adjustment, and down here, I'll assign Shift Option M to the Live Motion Blur Filter Layer. I'll now switch across to the Arrange category. This lets me assign shortcuts to common layer operations. For example, I'll use Shift Option I for Move Inside and Shift Option O for Move Outside. Further down the list, there's also an operation called Insertion Inside. I'll assign this to Shift I. Then I'll close the dialog. Now I can use a couple of these newly assigned shortcuts to speed up the child layer process. With the glare layer selected, I'll use Shift I. This toggles insertion inside. Now I'll use Option B, which will create a brightness contrast adjustment. Because I toggled insertion inside, this will go straight inside the glare layer as a child layer, and I can bring the brightness slider all the way up to increase the intensity of the glare effect. I'm now going to place the normals render pass. This contains three dimensional lighting information for the render. However, there is a slight issue because I previously had a child layer selected. 
Therefore, the new layer has been brought in as a child layer of the glare layer. I can use the shortcut I bound earlier, Shift Option O, to move this layer outside and back to the parent layer stack. I'll just quickly align it with the other render passes, and I'll now add a normals adjustment using Option N, which is another custom shortcut I set up earlier. Then I'll use Shift Option I to move it inside the normals render pass. Now that I'm inside the render pass, I'll use Option M to add a channel mixer adjustment, then change the color model to gray to convert the color information to a weighted grayscale intensity model. I'll select the parent render pass and change its blend mode to soft light. This slightly complex setup now allows me to click on the normals adjustment thumbnail to bring its dialog back up, and I can use the rotation slider to control the lighting within the render. I'll hide the normals pass layer so you can appreciate the difference. Using this technique allows me to bring focus to the central building without making the overall lighting of the scene look unbalanced. Now I'm going to place some cutouts into the scene. Once again, I'll make sure I'm at the top of the layer stack. And rather than using File Place, I will once again opt for the drag drop approach. So I'll look in the cutouts folder and find the men walking. PNG file. Then drag drop it into photo and release the mouse button over the document to place this file as an image layer. The high image resolution means that this cutout comes in at a large size. I have the move tool selected already, so I'll scale this layer down using one of the corner nodes for proportional scaling. Then I'll zoom in, scale it down further and position it in the scene. When it comes to transforming layers, all transformations are performed non-destructively, regardless of the layer type. Therefore, you don't need to be concerned about losing image resolution or quality when scaling, rotating, or shearing layers. If I wanted to explicitly commit this scaling, I could right-click the layer, either on the Document View, or on the Layers panel, and choose Rasterize. But because I want to work non-destructively, I'll leave this layer as it is. Now I will want to adjust this cutout layer so it better suits the surrounding lighting. Again, I can take advantage of those custom shortcuts I set up previously. I'll use Shift-I, then Option-B to place a brightness contrast adjustment directly into the cutout layer. I'll modify both brightness and contrast until the cutout renders more appropriately against the surrounding lighting. I may also want to quickly block in some basic shadow detail underneath the feet here. To achieve this, I'll first select the normals layer beneath the men walking cutout layer. Then I'll create a new pixel layer using either this option on the layers panel or the keyboard shortcut Shift Command N on Mac, Shift Control N on Windows. I'll then select the paintbrush tool using B. The default brush nozzle is a round brush with 80% hardness. To quickly create a squished oval nozzle, I can use a keyboard and mouse modifier. I'll hold Control and Option on Mac, Control and Alt on Windows, then left click once to toggle across to shape and spacing. I can click drag and move the cursor left to gradually decrease the shape of the brush until it becomes more oval. And, still holding the modifier keys, I can left-click once again to toggle across to rotation, then left-click and drag to rotate the brush until it is horizontal. Finally, I might also reduce the hardness to 0%. I can do this on the context toolbar, in addition to using the keyboard and mouse modifier. Now, I can single-click to stamp this oval shadow shape beneath the feet. When I am finished, I can use H to switch to the view tool, and this will stop me from accidentally brushing anywhere else. To stay organized, I can also name this pixel layer by double-clicking on its text. I'll type shadows and use return to confirm. I'll insert another cutout, so I'll go out to the file browser and drag-drop this woman with camera PNG file 
into the document. However, before releasing the mouse button, I can hold Option on Mac, Alt on Windows. Rather than placing the image at its full resolution, this will instead switch to the Place Image tool. I can now click drag to draw the image out at a scale of my choosing, then release the mouse button to confirm it. I'll use the same shortcuts to perform tonal blending with this cutout as well. So I'll use Shift I, Option B. I can then reduce the brightness and increase contrast until the lighting looks more suitable. I may want to add some motion blur to this cutout to create the impression of a long exposure effect. To do this non destructively, I can take advantage of live filter layers. First, I'll make sure I have the parent cutout layer selected and not the child brightness contrast adjustment. Then, I can go to Layer, New Live Filter Layer, Blur, Motion Blur. Alternatively, you may remember that I bound a shortcut to this operation earlier, which is now listed to the right. I can use this to instantly add a motion blur layer, which automatically child layers into the cutout. To configure the effect, I could use the radius slider and rotation option on the dialog. But with many filters, you can click drag on the document view to control various parameters. Doing this with the motion blur allows me to easily determine the direction and strength of the blur. An easy way to think of live filters is as adjustment layers that apply filter effects. You can mask them, hide and show them, change their blending options, and click on the layer thumbnail to reopen the dialog and change the parameters at any time. For example, I might reduce the overall amount of motion blur. Then I can close the dialog again. To stay organized, I may wish to group the cutouts. I'll collapse the parent layers on the layers panel, then shift click and select these three layers. I can then use Command G on Mac, Control G on Windows to group them. And I'll double click and name this group Cutouts. By default, group thumbnails will display the contents of the group. To make groups more distinguishable, however, you may prefer to click on the panel options here and disable Show Group Thumbnails. This will instead display a folder icon for groups. I could also right click to color tag this group, which is especially useful if I am working to a color coding convention when collaborating with others. I'll also color tag the render passes by selecting them all, then right clicking and choosing a color tag from the bottom. Finally, I may wish to export this composition to an interchange format. I can go to File, Export, and choose a format from the top drop down here. Typical formats such as PNG and JPEG are available, but for interchange workflows, I'll quickly demonstrate a couple of useful techniques. The Affinity apps support PSD, import, and export, so it's possible to collaborate with others outside of the Affinity file format ecosystem. Do be aware, however, that any unique Affinity layer types, such as live filter layers, will have to be rasterized and so will no longer be editable. Pixel and image layers and common adjustment layers will, however, be retained. An alternative solution may be to use TIFF. On the export options, you can enable Save Affinity Layers. This will save a flattened bitmap that will open in any other software, but will also allow you to bring the TIFF file back into any of the Affinity apps and access the full layer stack if further edits are required. And there we go. That was an overview of an ArcViz composition workflow in Affinity Photo. I hope you found it useful and thank you for watching.